So without further ado, as we're going to move on to the beginning of the next panel, but first uh, I'd like to introduce Chris Paniski, who um, to those in the space is uh, a famous, infamous, uh, legendary, one of those, those adjectives. Um, so Chris, come on stage. Chris was um, uh, previously quite early on, well, up until about a year and a half, a year ago, working at ARC, um, looking at investing in this space, and then has since set up his own uh, venture capital firm uh, called uh, Placeholder, uh, and uh, is particularly notable for the work he's done on a book on the topic of crypto assets, which I'd like to say I've read, but what I really mean I've, I've listened to on Audible while I've been, been running, uh, but it's almost the same thing. Um, and uh, also, in particular, doing lots of detailed work on uh, how do you value these new crypto asset assets. As, and, and we were talking about taxonomy of emotions just then. We've now got this increasing taxonomy of, uh, of these different token types. Um, so Chris, first of all, you're fresh off the plane. How are you I'm feeling? I'm fresh off the plane. I'm feeling great. Thanks for having me. You know, good for you to be here. And um, I think this topic of valuation has uh, come up um, in a few different ways throughout the day uh, so far. And there are kind of uh, security tokens where people are starting to talk about what the liquidity premium might be. That's one angle. And there may be other security tokens, um, uh, and sorry, the ones against assets that have a clear kind of book value, and maybe other assets where you need to do some kind of discounted cash flow. But the big sort of contentious area is of this whole area of, um, uh, you know, does your token become a kind of a credible store of value in addition to the increasingly credible store of value you might see in Bitcoin or Ethereum? Um, and um, within, if you've built it to have some intrinsic um, or be intrinsically necessary to a, some new decentralized you know, data network, um, how do you get around this equation of exchange conundrum that the kind of the more frequently it's changing hands and um, and the more competition there is for that particular space, sure. the less likely it is to have any value. So sure. I just was, this is an evolving area, uh, and I've most recently been sitting down with John Pfeffer, but it's good to sit down with you because I feel like we're maybe in the more similar church on this. Well, I think the first thing to realize is we don't have it figured out, right? It, it certainly is an evolving conversation. Um, and to start, I think it's important to realize there's a taxonomy to the crypto space. Um, and I consider a crypto asset to be the native asset that's a coordinating force between the supply side and the demand side in a decentralized information network. And so that is a very different basis of value. It's not a cash flow um, basis of value. And so I would lump security tokens, for example, into a upgraded wrapper of the equity asset class and not actually put it in the crypto asset asset class. It may have, uh, security tokens may have a premium um, based upon their cash flows. Um, but that's a relatively understood area, as you mentioned, with DCFs. Uh, within the crypto asset space where we have cryptocurrencies, crypto commodities, crypto tokens, um, there are, as with any asset, two paths we can take. We can take the relative valuation path. Um, so for example, um, price to earnings or price to sales for equities within the crypto space, one of the more famous ones is network value to transactions ratio. Um, and really what we're doing there is if you think about a equity and its utility that it provides to an investor is its earnings, then a equity is priced as a multiple of its earnings. And a crypto asset with an underlying consensus system the utility it provides there is a transactional layer. And so that crypto asset can be priced as a multiple of its transaction volume. So Bitcoin trades at roughly 80 times transaction uh, volume. Now, there's a lot to unpack in the relative valuation space. I think the more contentious area is the intrinsic valuation side. Um, that's where I've been using the equation of exchange, which is MV equals PQ. Um, traditionally, within monetarism, you assume V is constant. Um, you assume Q is constant, and this is used to show if you increase the monetary base, you have price inflation. Um, I use it somewhat differently where uh, I set up a crypto economy of size PQ, so this is the average price of the basket of goods offered by that crypto economy, the quantity of goods which you can project using an S-curve within a total addressable market, and then a certain velocity to solve for the necessary monetary base 
to serve that crypto economy. Um, highly contentious, that equation has always been contentious within economics, and uh, layering it on top of crypto only makes it worse. Well, indeed, and, and I feel like um, certainly there's this discussion saying, like, this is the mathematical identity, even though it feels to me that in this case we're interpreting it the other way around from how it's usually used in macroeconomics, um, you know, because the velocity is changing a lot and the output is, is then the price. Uh, and, and, and one question I had on it was, um, you know, if you say in a given network maybe the, the resource under management is, is storage, uh, and you tend to ascribe um, a, a cost for that storage um, uh, and will essentially equate that to P. Yes. Uh, um, is that the right way to think about the resources being um, coordinated or the scarce resources being coordinated or mobilized? Because it, it, sort of two things. Firstly, it seems to me that a lot of the resources being mobilized in these networks actually ultimately is people and their behavior. And, and, and I think if something you've mentioned a couple of times, uh, I believe, and things you've written is, does it really fully account for kind of network effects? So you get network effects in with currencies in, in the macro economy, but not to the same degree where you have a lot of data being generated and compounded in a, in a network. And it feels like those network effects very much you know, do increase the value of the network the higher Mm -hmm. the velocity of, of, mm -hmm. of the token being used? So I would say the way uh, the network effects uh, work, work their way into the equation is really in that S-curve, right? How, how quickly we assume something will be adopted. Um, now, you're certainly right that these crypto economies, you mentioned file storage, right? File storage may only be one use case, but you can actually layer on top of that a, con a content delivery network, right? So then you really have two economies within one network or maybe two services within one network. Um, but you can do a sum of the parts valuation for that. I think you know running with the example of file storage, so long as we keep everything in dollar terms because the world is largely dollarized, um, then we can project a price per gigabyte, so that's a dollar per gigabyte. We can project a quantity of gigabytes. Multiplying those two together, you get a dollar value, which is representative of the GDP of that crypto network in provisioning file storage. Um, and you know there are network effects that will, will allow that network to grow really quickly, yeah. right? Um, but that's part of the pro projection within the S-curve. Velocity is really the um, hardest variable. You know, Early on, when I did projections with this, I was just indexing off of Bitcoin and saying, OK, this will have a higher velocity than Bitcoin because of X, Y, Z. Um, Alex Evans, who we actually just brought on at Placeholder, mm. did a good post. Um, so my original post is just called Crypto Asset Valuations, if people want to read it. Um, but Alex did a better piece, which is on value, velocity, and monetary theory, where he calculates velocity endogenously to the the calculation, and so it's not an abstract variable, it's actually part of the whole setup. So, so I need to give you the chance to introduce the, the panel and so forth. I think beyond the file storage example, the more interesting one is if you think about the classic decentralized Uber example, uh, where there's maybe a, some, some staking going on, but there's also you know, this uh, data network effect around reputation mm -hmm. and people's uh, involvement in, in the brand and their commitment to the, to, to the platform. Yes. How, you know, and where does the value get shared between those people who've, who own tokens and, and the consumer because this is a better service, but we may not have time for I that won't, now. I won't open up that kind of no, We'll come back to it. So good, so well, I'll pass over to you, Chris. Thank you very sure. much. And um, I'll see you afterwards. Thank you. And you can introduce the panel. Yeah, if our panelists would like to come up, Yuri, Robert, Charlie. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves because they will do a much better job of it than I would. So we have Robert first, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Robert Norton. I'm the founder CEO of a company called Verisart. We started in 2015 with the idea of using the Bitcoin blockchain for certification of physical artworks and collectibles. Um, we're now kind of three years in and work with uh, leading artist studios like Shepard Ferry and um, leading online auction platforms like Paddle 8. Uh, as well as artist rights organizations such as DAX here in the UK. Um, we currently do not use a non-fungible token in our stack. It's something that we're looking at. Uh, we've obviously been uh, enamored by the um, uh, consumer craze of CryptoKitties and seen 
um, that non-fungible token um, proved to be quite popular and it's something that we're now considering with regards to the information of the user within our network. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Charlie. I'm a principal at Pantera Capital, one of the largest hedge funds uh, in the space. Uh, I got into Bitcoin in early 2012 and dropped out of high school to go to MIT and Silvio to do research in Silvio Macaulay's group. And after a year there, dropped out to join Pantera uh, as an investor. Yuri? All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Yuri. I'm a CEO and founder of Zero Exert. Uh, my background is I've worked at a company before uh, where we've issued more than half a million certificates every year. This kind of got us into blockchain. I've been a blockchain enthusiast for, for a very long time in today's terms. Um, me and my co-founder basically wanted to, to build the first platform um, after CryptoKitties came out to build, uh, to actually issue certificates with the help of blockchain. Then that kind of expanded to what we're doing today. Um, yeah, that's it. Great. So in six months, uh, Bitcoin will have its 10th anniversary, its 10th birthday. And largely for the majority of the history of the space, we have focused on fungible tokens. If something like Bitcoin loses fungibility and I can't transfer one Bitcoin for another, then as a currency, it loses its value. Um, that said, blockchains are general purpose data layers um, for coordinating data uh, amongst disparate actors. And so they can be used to transfer any kind of asset. And uh, really starting last year, Yuri mentioned CryptoKitties, um, non-fungibles became uh, a new design space of focus within crypto. Uh, and if we, if we back up a little bit in history and we look at last year, some people would claim that part of the frenzy of last year was set off by the ERC-20 standard, which was a standard for fungible tokens on top of Ethereum. Uh, famously, the DAO in the middle of 2016 uh, provided a, a proof point of what a fungible token on top of Ethereum could do. And then lo and behold, about half a year later, we had a boom of fungible tokens on top of Ethereum. We now have a standard known as ERC-721 um, that will be merged in here shortly. Uh, and that is a non-fungible standard. And so there are some people, investors, developers, so on and so forth, that think we will have a wave of non-fungible tokens uh, in, the, in the short future. So I want to start with uh, non-fungibles broadly, or, or say just the, the use of blockchains to record any kind of asset. Do we think this is one of our early drivers um, of adoption, the, the much uh, sought adoption within the crypto space? Yuri, I'll start with you and then work across. Well, yeah, I think, you know, CryptoKitties, um, if you look in the, in the history of, of how things get adopted, it's not so rare that every time a new game comes on, on a platform, that that platform kind of reaches that critical mass and that takes off. I think while, you know, it was, I remember when we were um, at the first, uh, when we were looking at CryptoKitties in our team, it was kind of like a joke, right? They, they clogged up the Ethereum network and it was, it was almost unbelievable that it will take off as it is right now. But it, I think it makes sense. So it, I think it's just a natural progression of, of things um, you know, towards the space and towards the point where a lot of people kind of uh, start talking about it, see the additional value that this technology brings. Uh, I think that CryptoKitties, you know, the way it evolves right now, the way the whole project evolves, also the second tier uh, collectibles that are on top of CryptoKitties. Now you have crypto hats. Uh, you have all these different games where you can battle CryptoKitties around. Um, it's just like a natural progression towards what we're planning to do in the long term is actually using 721 for things that are like, I can't say more serious, but more applicable in our everyday lives. So for different certifications, even for, for identity perhaps, uh, for authentication, so stuff like that. Um, so I think it's, this is very healthy. Um, I think we'll see a lot of uh, things being built on 721. Uh, but we'll have to go through this crypto kitties and, and game space in the beginning. Charlie, do you see it as a meaningful driver of adoption in the short to medium term here? Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't really agree with that, actually. Uh, crypto kitties, is, is, uh, its usage is down 99%, but the level of uh, depth or complexity or the, the, um, the complexity of a community that could be built around it was just so low that there's no intuitive reason to me, and there wasn't at the time why. Uh, it would be a sustainable ecosystem. Um, so I think 
in the context of like non-fungible tokens, what makes them interesting to me uh, is not um, necessarily like how serious what you're doing with them is. I think video games are probably one of the most interesting things that you can do with them. Um, if you look at sort of like games of sufficient complexity over time that they've developed independent communities around them. So pretty much pick any sufficiently popular game uh, and you'll see things like private servers created around them when there are changes made to it. Uh, portions of the community will in effect fork off and go build their own around it. Um, the idea that you can do this in a way more principled way uh, with non-fungible tokens, like in that specific instance, uh, makes like a ton of sense to me. Um, the idea that uh, in, for example, the main uh, server of World of Warcraft, like items have like assigned values to them. If you've ever played a game on Steam, they actually have like a you know active marketplace around basically every item in the game, uh, all of which have unique characteristics to them uh, in ways that make them not entirely fungible for the most part. Um, and you can actually like, extend this with sort of this scheme. Uh, the idea that you can essentially uh, allow communities uh, more easily to fork off away from each other and, and to his point, build things on top of uh, in, in a principled sort of like formal way um, where it's, it's not as, uh, it's not as ad hoc as it usually is. Makes makes a lot of sense to me. I think that's like super interesting, and and in practice gives communities uh, sort of like more control over. Actually, similarly to uh, the same argument you can make about blockchains in general, I think that like in the context of specifically like these gaming communities, you're basically giving uh, a community more control over their ability to decide the future of it, fork away from it, etc. In a principled way, where it's not as uh, it's not as kind of just like scraped together. Great. And Robert, I find your position interesting because you founded Verisart in 2015. Um, and so you've been intimately involved with, say, the adoption curve, um, or, or at least your ear to the floor. And you guys, uh, at least thus far, have not incorporated a non-fungible token because that's a relatively new phenomenon within the space, but have nonetheless been using Bitcoin's blockchain <clears throat> as a means of provenance and, and recording the transfer of art and collectibles. So are you seeing um, you know, this use case uh, with a meaningful uptick right now, or do you think it's still farther out? Well, before I uh, founded Verisa, I founded a company called Sedition. And Sedition um, brought together 100 of the world's leading artists from Jenny Holzer, Damien Hirst, Bill Viola, Mint Shepard Ferry, and many others that created works in digital format. And they were purchased through the platform. And if you buy a Samsung frame TV, you actually have the uh, Sedition artworks uh, bundled in as part of that. Um, and a lot of the digital artists, um, you know, Ian Chang, John Rathman, and others that uh, we were sort of in discussions with back then, you know, they're like, I don't know if I'm talking on a panel, in fact, in two days at Art Basel with Simon Denny, they're like, oh, wow, so we try to build all this digital art and reach new audiences, and actually what the world really wanted was CryptoKitties. <laughs> and um, prior to such a night, I'd been at uh, King.com running the business in North America, so very familiar with the um, uh, rocket-like effect of a hit game. You know, we had it with Candy Crush. And um, what I think is so interesting about CryptoKitties is the fact that it has brought to the fore this discussion of a non-fungible token. I think it's probably the best example of a widespread use of a non-fungible token out there. Um, I think what I've learned is that there's always this danger of uh, audience divergence, that you think just because something works in a traditional way, that's the way it's going to work uh, in a digital way. In fact, a lot of the uh, art uh, uh, ICO businesses right now are kind of saying, hey, there's a bunch of crypto wealth. That means they want to buy traditional art and collectibles. Actually, if you look at reality, what they did want to buy is CryptoKitties, at least the native Ethereum community. And so what I think the, that, that shows is the uh, importance of really the, the product and, and getting the audience fit right uh, is much more important than, than anything else. Um, and with regards to you know, whether I think it's uh, uh, here to stay, I, I, I think it's too soon to say whether or not the non-fungible token um, uh, approach is the right approach for all types of certification for, for, for physical works. I think that what it's shown is that what people want is something that is you know, collectible, adorable, breedable. And if you take away the breedable aspect, I would kind of um, query how successful CryptoKitties would have been. Um, so I think that what it does is it opens up 
um, really new ways of thinking about what kind of what, what, what digital collectibles means to um, the 21st century collector or 21st century consumer. You raise a good point around often when we have a new disruptive technology, we try and map it directly to existing use cases as opposed to uh, discovering the brand new use cases. Uh, so Yuri, you all are in the midst of doing a token sale right now, building a platform with a lot of the learning, say, from CryptoKitties. Um, I'd be curious to know what the utility of, of your token is within uh, Zero Excert and then why you feel the time is now. Yeah, just to maybe follow up on that question, I think one of the value of 721 of any non-fungible tokens is that it kind of mimics what happens in the real world in very detail. So in terms of just certificates, you know, you get handed certificates to you directly. So this way you get them stored in your wallet, right? then you're able to send them to somebody else, which is like the same in real life. You get to send them to somebody else. Then you have a central authority of um, an issuer, right? Uh, you can have it reissued. So these are all the things that are now available very easily um, with non-fungible tokens. Now in terms of what we're doing is, uh, basically our protocol allows anybody to deploy and then issue their own uh, non-fungible tokens. So deploy the smart contract, issue these tokens, act as an authority. Now this is where our token comes in because you know, if, you, if you're uh, trying to issue these tokens uh, as college degrees as Stanford, um, and then another Stanford pops up in Germany and another Stanford in India and two in Romania, which Stanford is the right Stanford, right? Now, our token is basically used in a token-created registry with which we will verify which issuers are who they're really claiming they are. And I think the TCR, so the token-created registry, is something that's very closely related to, to non-fungibles right now in terms of you know, technological advancements, how to issue these tokens, how to verify the issuers. So our token will basically act, uh, basically be a staking token where you will have to stake a portion of your tokens to get to that list and then be a verified issuer. And I think this is extremely important because by that, doing it that way, you're doing it in a decentralized way. Otherwise, there's always some authority in the back who's saying, well, uh, these guys are good, these guys are not good, these guys are fake. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the idea behind the token. And uh, for those of you who TCRs or token carrier registries is a new term, I would encourage you to Google it. Um, it's a, a relatively new crypto economic primitive um, that's used exactly as the term says to curate registries or lists. Um, and it can be binary, uh, there can be sorting, there's all kinds of experimentation um, with it right now. So Charlie, um, we've had a few firms make public investments uh, around the non-fungible space, notably uh, USV and Andreessen Horowitz backed the team that, that created CryptoKitties. Um, I've heard other firms are investing in the CryptoKitties themselves. Um, and so when I think about this space, I think of there being potentially origination platforms. Um, I think of there as then being the non-fungibles that are originated on those platforms, and then also the exchanges that uh, provide for, for the exchanging of NFTs. Do you have an opinion on where value will accrue or where Pantera is looking right now? Yeah, so we never invested in CryptoKitties uh, directly and have no plan to, i.e. like the actual kitties themselves. Um, we also did not invest in the design house behind it, uh, nor any exchanges that are specifically catering to NFTs in the future. Um, that being said, I think the most interesting uh, part of this is that uh, it is, is like the design house uh, aspect of it, or I would view it more as if someone, and I would love for this to happen by the way, so if you have a really good pitch for this, like this would be awesome. Um, that. Uh, I think that the most interesting way that you can kind of get exposure to this or what I would like to see happen ideally uh, is for someone to bring us a pitch on, I'm going to create uh, this game of sufficient complexity, um, which is by itself not an easy task, but with the aspect of it that all of it will be open source and uh, all of the individual items in it will be in the form of NFTs that have certain interaction uh, you know, possibilities like breeding, but in a much more, I think, uh, not even that much more complicated, but just because it's like a combinatorial interaction, basically like it, it becomes much more interesting very quickly. Um, and at any given point in time, anytime there's like, for example, like in the RuneScape community, like there's essentially a fork in it, 
uh, people can just go their separate ways, and we see what happens with this like infinitely expansive, uh, infinitely forking, you know, different varied set of communities behind this game that can change it in ways that they want or don't want, and build things on top of it that work in certain versions or all of them, whatever. Something like that seems like wildly fascinating, and I imagine that if you look at the success of CryptoKitties from the perspective of like how many they sold, whatever, and like the initial adoption that. Um, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be super interesting. So I, we'd, be, we'd be interested in investing in something like that. Beyond that, um, it doesn't intuitively make sense to me why uh, I would want to own any of the existing NFTs that are out there as an investment or the exchanges for them. Um, but I guess that could change in the future. If there's like a more, I guess, uh, if there's a use case that seemed more interesting and sticky. Well, if there's one thing this, this space does is it's a, it evolves quickly. Yeah. Um, so I find the, the difference between Verisart and Xerox Cert interesting because you all have chosen to focus on art and collectibles, um, while Xerox Cert is, say, approaching the non-fungible asset class more broadly. I'd like to start with you, Robert, and Verisart, and why you all went with a specific focus, um, and then come to you, Yuri, after for why you're going more broad. Um, in our case, it was just the fact that I'd founded Sedition um, previously, and then before that, Saatchi Art. So I was familiar with the art landscape. Um, and one of the artists that we worked with, uh, MIT graduate uh, Casey Reese, wrote to me in uh, 2014 about um, blockchain. I, I thought you'd joined a sex gang. I don't know what he was talking about. I mean, I had no <laughs> idea. I really was not one of these kind of early Bitcoin um, purchases. Um, but as I kind of looked into it and went down my own rabbit hole, like many people do, it just became very evident that um, there was a real problem of trust in the art market. Um, and I think many people could attest to disputed provenance. And unlike other industries where, you know, you have a trusted central registry, so if you're buying a Rolex watch or a Patek Philippe watch, you know, you can go check if your watch is real with the central registry. And there's actually not a great incentive for trusted central registries to put themselves in a, in a, in a, in a kind of blockchain infrastructure. Although many blockchain entrepreneurs will, will argue otherwise. But in the case of the art market, there is real problems because the actual trusted registry may change over time. It might be the artist studio, it might be the gallery, it might be an auction house, it might be a foundation. And so the, whenever you have uh, uh, data duplication, you have a, a high chance of errors and omissions. And when you look at the art market, um, it just doesn't work because the most well-known artists of the 20th century, Basquiat, Warhol, Lichtenstein, Rauschenberg, um, Bourgeois, you name it, they won't authenticate their own artist works. That's not a position that you want today's successful artists to end up in. So I really do believe that, uh, and when we started, the Bitcoin blockchain was the only choice, and, and largely through discussions with um, Peter Todd, he informed our architecture and still uh, continues to. So we have uh, anchored ourselves to the Bitcoin blockchain, and it's very good for our proof of existence purposes. It has its limitations as we do want to explore smart contracts. But right now, our business is really about better um, certification standards and getting the art world that, on the whole, don't even want to give you paper certificates to actually start seeing digital certificates as a norm. And to that end, we're making some progress. And really quick, how do you monetize your business? We, we charge $2.50 <laughs> per certificate. OK, got it. And for those of you that aren't aware, Peter Todd is a core developer uh, for Bitcoin. And I was actually surprised to see him involved, because he tends to be pretty conservative uh, with what he gets involved in. Well, yeah, we, 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 we describe him as, as our chief naysayer. <laughs> Uh, so Yuri, why did you guys decide to go more broad uh, with this use case? Yeah, like, like I said before, uh, we started off with certificates as well. These were mostly educational certificates. Um, but my CTO, so my co-founder, he has a history in open source. He's been an open source developer for around 30 years already. Uh, he did a lot of contributions. And you know, ultimately, what it boiled down to was where can we provide the most value for the community? We knew that this was kind of like first mover advantage that we have if we were to build a platform to allow other people to build on top of it. Um, so, but, but the whole idea then kind of like evolved from certificates to allowing anybody to issue anything with non-fungible tokens. And the whole, um, you know, the platform, what it does right now is it allows you to actually issue a non-fungible token without writing a single line of code in Solidity. Um, we're Ethereum first. 
Uh, we're also blockchain agnostic, meaning that we will expand to other blockchains as well later on. Um, but I, I like to put it to people, we're not good at art, we're not good at, and I'd like to talk to you later about this, uh, because I think we have the, the, the best layer out there to, to help you go to non-fungibles. We're not good at art, we're not good at real estate, we're not good at all these things that are coming to non-fungible tokens. But we have a very good underlying technology that allows you to issue that very fast, to go through this without the painstaking process of auditing the code, without developing stuff on, the, on, on Ethereum itself. So that's kind of the value that we saw that could be the most valuable to the community that early on. So a non-technical person could launch a non-fungible off of Xerox or A completely non-technical person. So there's a few libraries that are being built right now, but if you want to check it out, uh, you can go to manager.xerxer.org, and we have a user interface there where you can actually issue your very own, uh, deploy your very own non-fungible token contract and issue your very own non-fungible token. All right, I'm going to switch gears a little to talk about the underlying platforms. Uh, we just had EOS launch uh, without any contention. And uh, EOS has brought back to the forefront a conversation that's always there around how decentralized is decentralized enough. And so Charlie, I'd be curious, you mentioned, say, you're looking for something, say, a bit more complex, a bit more robust in, in the use case. Um, what's your feeling on? How decentralized is decentralized enough? Um, are you a decentralization mac maximalist? Are you a decentralization pragmatist? Um, and, and how do you use that in your approach with, with different NFT platforms you see? OK, first, uh, I think there's a false equivalency in there uh, between complexity and decentralization. Um, Fair enough. Which doesn't, it is not, I, I, I've actually given this more thought uh, than I let on, but uh, I guess you can imagine, for example, in the context of a game uh, on some plasma cache side chain where all of them are represented by NFTs uh, and certain interactions are allowed for, I don't know, you could do something relatively simple just uh, without requiring like a super, a super incentive compatible proof of stake mechanism, but just well enough that you have. Uh, some, something that works well enough. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't intuitively seem to me in the context of NFTs uh, that I think that one of the hardest issues will be origination, uh, especially in the context of like with, with complexity, it's not possible for me to uh, validate all of the, for example, physics rules in a game without getting like too deep into this uh, or enforce an anti-cheat or or whatever. It's, it's not going to happen to run RuneScape right off of Ethereum. That being said, I imagine there are probably ways to structure it so that you don't have uh, that much trust in the system. Like, I'm, I'm sure that you could find a happy medium at which uh, perhaps individual item origination or those that have the possibility for um, very extended interaction with other NFTs. Like, I think it's a very system-specific thing, basically. Um, and in this context, I don't have as much of an issue with I guess centralization risk because it is already so much better than the alternative if you are given the ability to fork off of it, even if it requires uh, a new centralized arbiter of NFT origination. So like this is in contrast to like use or verticals like, for example, if you told me that we're going to have like a prediction market that happens to have a token on it running on Ethereum, I would say that's never going to work and it's really stupid. Um, in this case, I, I see less reason why uh, why it would not be, why it would not still be less bad than the current system, which if anyone here has ever been involved with a video game that had um, a really uh, involved community, but maybe made some decisions that resulted in people splitting off from it, like it's not a super fun experience. And like having grown up playing a bunch of these kinds of games, um, this is something that's relatively close to my heart. And I actually think that people would uh, really, really glom onto. So like. Um, the standard example I give is like a forkable version of EVE Online, I think would be like, if, if you could, if it is realistically possible to build, would just be like radically popular. And I think there would be thousands upon thousands of sub-communities on top of it, things like that. And uh, if that's possible with, for example, maybe like an open source, uh, the, engine, the underlying engine being open source um, and all of the tokens being on some public blockchain like Ethereum, then maybe that's good enough. Maybe in the future you get things that are fast enough where, I don't know, you get more complex interactions. But um, I guess to try and wrap up the answer, the, um, 
the level of decentralization that I require is specific to the vertical that it's in. Um, and in this case, I think it's so much less bad than the alternative, the existing alternative, even with more centralization than maybe like an absolute maximalist would say makes it not entirely trustless. Um, it's, I mean, I, feel, I still think it's pretty interesting. And if you look at CryptoKitties, right, like the origination is centralized and like no one yeah. really has that much of an issue with it. Yeah, well, and it sounds like uh, for you, the right to fork the system is the protection for the users and that supersedes how centralized or decentralized? Um, in this context, yeah. So I think that uh, this would be like what Vitalik would call the right to exit. So I think one of the most, uh, or one of the best ways to kind of think about uh, decentralized systems, not um, the only uh, facet of it, but like on some infinitely dimensional gradient, one of the ones that I consider most important, uh, would be um, or an infinitely dimensional gradient from not decentralized to decentralized. One of the most interesting parts of it to me is like your right to exit a system. Um, and so if you think about like, okay, currently in existing video games, and I'm not saying that this is the only vertical, it's just one that I've thought most about because I've had the experience of not being able to exit a system that made like a shitty decision. Uh, then this is, gives you a significantly higher right to exit. And it seems somewhat in line with um, other verticals in which we think like more decentralized things could help, uh, more power being given to a community to decide its own future, things like that. So, got it. So, Robert, you guys have been building on top of Bitcoin um, while Yuri, you all are building on top of Ethereum. I'd be curious: Have you been happy building on top of Bitcoin? Do you plan to stay on top of Bitcoin? Um, you know, maybe some of your learnings, some of the hard knocks. Uh, whatever you want to share specifically about building on top of Bitcoin. Um, well, we had a tough time when um, the Bitcoin price was rising so fast that the cost of uh, each of our certificates became kind of prohibitive. Um, but we overcame that by um, effectively batching our records and uh, making batch commits. Um, and so that was a learning curve. Um, we have found it difficult to innovate as much as we perhaps would want to if there was more you know, programmable out of the box uh, solutions that you know Ethereum make uh, more readily available. Um, but in terms of you know our core um, clients, you know, which are people in the art market, they're just about getting now uh, a to understand what uh, the blockchain is and why that's relevant for their business, um, and b um, therefore their feelings start more comfortable. Uh, about the fact that we're using uh, the most widely used distributed ledger technology, certainly in terms of uh, volume. And um, that's been helpful to us. If we were now having to go to uh, these um, partners and enforce our token uh, as a requirement for them to use our platform, I think that at this point would be a very high hurdle for them to, um, to, to, to pass through. Um, one thing I'd like to say about the sort of question between decentralization and centralization, you know, it is evident that some of the most popular um, services, you know, as you kind of pointed out, have a strong centralized aspect to it. In the case of CryptoKitties, um, yes, you have a, a, a wallet and you have a smart contract and you have a non-fungible token, but ultimately um, those kitties, kitties are served by uh, Amazon S3. Um, and so likewise with Coinbase, you know, there's a strong centralized uh, component well, to it. Well, I mean, not really. You don't need, I mean, I can, I can interact directly like off the, like the CLI, like it's not actually hosted off of S3. It's originated in a centralized way, but like in CryptoKitties.com is hosted in, in a centralized way. But like the actual CryptoKitties themselves, like I can, you, if you really wanted to, like you could pull fingernails and just do it purely with like, you know. Right, if you really wanted to. Sure, right? but so like. What, my, point, my point is Or that you could build a secondary website that is not hosted off of S3. Right, but my, my, what I was going to say is that when you look at pure decentralization, and it's this issue of who your audience are, you know, mainly it, it's developers that can really operate on a purely decentralized platform. There is an a level of centralized service that makes something user friendly. I'd give you an analogy. Um, you know, when I was at AOL in '96. Uh, and uh, Steve Case was visiting us. We didn't have any subscribers in the UK at all. And some um, developer from the finance channel was like, look, this is going to work really well. All the user has to do is download this Java plugin. Steve Case is like, listen, half the nation's VCRs are still flashing 00, 00, 00 after 25 years. People are not going to understand how to download a Java plugin. Now, obviously, we've come a long way. But again, depending on what your audience is, you have to build your product accordingly. 
How did you guys handle the Bitcoin fork, actually? Because suddenly you had two chains and potentially two records. Um, I mean, I assume you went with Bitcoin, yeah. but did you then nullify any th the things that were on Bitcoin Cash? Uh, I think that I, this is a question that's beyond, okay. beyond me, but uh, we stayed with Bitcoin. Okay, got it. Um, and then Yuri, you guys are on Ethereum. I hear every day about a new Ethereum killer, um, just as you know, when Ripple came out, it was a Bitcoin killer. Um, are you guys staying with Ethereum? Um, how do you feel about building on top of Ethereum? Why Ethereum? I think that Ethereum um, has this very good ability to help the adoption curve go up with basically a lot of the things that are out there right now. So um, in our case, we think that because of CryptoKitties and because of Ethereum being very um, widely spread, it has a huge developer community, uh, it has a lot of people contributing to it, a lot of, um, also a lot of investors are looking at it as a good platform to start things off. And also, you can do your own crowd sale with Ethereum. Uh, these are all kind of the, the sort of the, uh, the the reasons why we wanted to to, to, to get started with Ethereum. Um, also, uh, the guy who is currently, uh, I think, one of the top non fungible experts in the world, uh, William Entrican, who is also the lead author of 721, uh, is an Ethereum developer. He's also on our team. Um, we, however, believe that it will go from Ethereum to next to the other blockchains. Ethereum has a lot of issues regarding scaling. Uh, nobody knows what will, you know, if non-fungibles take off, what will happen the next six months um, if the crypto kitty scenario repeats itself. But um, like I said, I think it's a great MVP platform. It's a great platform to start on. Um, I think for anything more serious, uh, you need to have your options open, keep your options open. OK, so we're almost out of time, so we're going to do a lightning round. Um, I want to know what the most bizarre or exciting uh, use cases you guys have seen for NFTs. Um, I'll selfishly start with myself. I heard about a NFT where you feed CryptoKitties to dragons, and the dragons grow in value as you feed them more and more expensive CryptoKitties. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, it kind of took me back to the days when people would burn uh, Bitcoin to create value uh, elsewhere. Let's start with you, Robert, and then work down the line to Charlie and Yuri. Well, I mean, as we're going for the kind of um, incredible uh, things I wouldn't have imagined, I would say <laughs> crypto masterpieces must be up there, which is taking public domain art and assigning crypto value to it and people wanting to buy um, that. Great. Uh, I also heard about that. I also heard about an idea for, instead of just doing that, then create a uh, a class of NFTs in which whatever you feed it has an algorithm market created on how valuable it is, and then it, and then you can feed it any NFT where the market decides uh, how valuable it ended up being. So you could theoretically have a dragon eating all other NFTs in existence. <laughs> that is one hell of a dragon, <laughs> Yuri. I'm going to move away from the gaming space. Sure. Uh, one thing that we're actually building for our own crowd sale is um, micro identity is something that is already um, exist. Uh, exists with non-fungible tokens. It's something that we're looking very heavily into. Uh, so just to give an example, when you do the white listing, when you do the KYC, you don't get an email with your dashboard login details. You get a certificate in your wallet, and if you have MetaMask installed, it automatically gets pulled in through Web3, and you can automatically access certain parts of the pages that are close to other people. And this brings like a whole new layer of applicability in terms of also gated content online. So you can have a license stored in your wallet. And with that license, you can access specific parts of the page or specific news or articles that you cannot access if you don't have a subscription, a license. So there's a lot of these things that I think are kind of great use cases. A really, I won't say bad use case, but a really interesting use case we got on, at Consensus is we've actually partnered with somebody up who wants to put trees on the blockchain. Um, so they, they bought this 10,000 acre land in, in Colombia, and they want to build um, the infrastructure behind so you could actually buy a tree and with every tree you get your own carbon footprint which you can then trade with companies with factories who are in shortage of their carbon quota i think it's 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 bizarre and amazing at the same time but i think it shows how vast the space is and what the opportunities are in the future great well thank you very much you guys yeah.